Hi, hello and welcome to another video by the Wu Mao Show. This is the Fermuwe channel and I want to welcome all of you, the old subscribers, the new subscribers and the people who just happen to stumble upon this video. Um, today, we are going to be talking with Bay Area 415 and um, we are going to be discussing a couple of things that um, came about from one of the videos that I made. I made a video talking about a lot of people um, calling me a commie or a CPC sympathizer, etc, etc, etc. So um, I decided to make a video to talk about how I felt about that, whether I felt that that was um, a good thing, a bad thing, justified, not justified. And there were certain aspects that um, Bay Area actually found interesting. And he said, like, hey, why don't we discuss this on a live stream and talk about, well, the essence of what you are trying to find out. Uh, some of the questions that I had were, okay, <laughs> When I pay taxes as an employee or as a business owner, does that make me a, a Communist Party of China supporter? And I guess it does. But it goes more into the intellectual side of it. In a sense, for me, I feel that I support the Communist Party of China for the work that they do and, and the reflections of their work uh, as it's seen here in China. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about the uh, the, the setting, the scenarios, and all the different theory about communism, socialism, etc. And there's nobody better to do this than Bay Area 50, uh, 415. He basically knows a lot about this stuff, and uh, he wants to share a lot of this information from us. So without further ado, let me bring Bay Area 415. Good evening. How are you, man? Good evening, Fernando. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about this. Uh, finally getting uh, the chance to talk about, you know, my favorite subjects, political subjects, ideology, a bit about China <laughs> and clarify the air uh, about a very, very convoluted kind of confusing area. I know a lot of people are in your seat right now, especially, you know, watching China and how much it's grown, but not really grasping or, you know, even having a different uh, perspective about communism and things like that. And really just want to set the stage on uh, how to understand it. So glad to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I want to do first, that I see that there are a lot of people watching. Could you guys let me know how the sound is? I see that Noel is there. He was um, uh, doing some work when you were doing your, your live stream with Daniel. Um, how's the sound? Because I often come out a little bit uh, low. Could somebody let me know in the comment section? I would appreciate it. Yeah, sound it looks all like good. sound is all good. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, so uh, the first question before we go actually into the um, the the topics, what moved you to to send me that, that DM on Twitter um, from that video that I made? Sure. So um, I think it's not just you that is kind of having these not only questions from other people, but questions about yourself and where do you really stand on, you know, understanding Marxism, socialism, communism, and especially, you know, uh, as a Latino myself, uh, I know how communism is in Latin America versus Asia versus other parts of the world and how, you know, uh, China's uh, development of their communism is different from how Venezuela is doing their government right now or Nicaragua or Cuba and how, you know, our experiences as Latinos versus, you know, witnessing China's growth, uh, miraculous and uh, extraordinary growth is, uh, is very telling, uh, but also mm -hmm. puts us in a position where it's like, you know, I really like what this government is doing and everything, but we've been inundated with a lot of uh, either propaganda on both sides or, uh, you know, really trying to understand what these definitions are and where do I really stand on, you know, if I support the CPC or if I support the ideology even, do I even call myself a communist uh, if that's the case? And, um, <laughs> and you know, I, I say it loud and proud on my channel. I am a communist, a Marxist-Leninist, uh, and that's what led me into supporting what China is doing. Um, and I've studied what China has done. You know, all the videos that I put out, uh, most of the videos that, that I put out uh, really uh, hone in on the books, the readings, the authors, and everything that uh, everybody that has tried to explain what socialism with Chinese characteristics is, the CPC, um, you know, is China imperialist, and everything that uh, 
all these questions that we get with a massive country like China, but also, you know, comparing that to Latin America and seeing what are, uh, what are we seeing down there, uh, you know, comparatively. So when I saw your video, I was like, you know what? Perfect opportunity. I, I know a lot of people have also been saying, hey, have you watched this guy? You, y'all should, uh, you know, connect. Y'all should do something. I was like, you know what? This is actually a perfect <laughs> opportunity to do that. You know, so it, it, it worked out. And I think, uh, uh, you know, thank you for having me in such short notice, especially right after that video. But, you know, uh, hopefully I can really help out clear the air and see where we can go from here. Sure. I think that uh, the, the first thing to do is uh, we've all... Uh, YouTubers here in China, we're actually showing you guys what life is like, what communism in practice is like. Um, so I want to go a little bit behind the the, the practice, the experience, what we're able to show you, and uh, talk a little bit about the, the the theory. So first of all, my understanding, and I'm here to be educated, and I hope that you guys are watching to be educated as well. My understanding on communism is more towards where a country gets its income as in for example in china uh, the land is owned by the government uh, if you buy a house for example you get a lease for 70 something years um, there'd be modifications to that law but that's in essence communism like the means of production uh, belong to the state or key means of production belong to the state and that's where they um, generate income for the country. My idea of socialism is what you do with that money. You could be a capitalist country and, and have socialist uh, policies that actually are going to spend the money in helping the people, in helping society, in building infrastructure. Um, that's my very simplistic uh, <laughs> understanding. So I, I, I give the microphone to you, the time to you to, to correct me or, or, I don't know, validate what I just said. So <laughs> where, where sure, am I right sure. or am I wrong? <laughs> well, we have to kind of start with a little bit of history on what really happened during this, uh, the time of Karl Marx. Um, in this sort of, uh, in this sort of era, we had the industrial revolution where lots of commodity, lots of capital, lots of things were going very rapidly. Um, and you know, there was a vast improvement in the standard of living compared to the other eras of feudalism, master slavery and whatnot. And, but there was still this very, anti-capitalist sediment, uh, especially among workers, because uh, that's basically consumed their life. And uh, there were a lot of thinkers, uh, especially utopian th thinkers that said, that were very anti-capitalist that said, you know, why are we doing this? Why should we, you know, there can be something better where everybody just gets what they need and works, how, uh, works as much as they need for society to function and things like that. However, these were, like I said, utopians and uh, what we call utopian socialism, where they were adamantly anti-capitalist. They had critiques about society and were aiming for something better, but they didn't have necessarily the steps or the science to get there. Marx and Engels comes in and saying, hey, we actually can put a, a, a science behind this in trying to understand our material world and how it develops. So long story short, when we get to the idea of communism, it's more about economy and the reality of our world rather than, you know, a type of system of government. Um, Marxism is not only a political ideology, but it's a way of observing the world. Um, and that's why you see different classes of Marxism, not only in politics, but other, uh, uh, other areas as well. Uh, that takes a more class approach, like, uh, you know, the rich between uh, the gap between the rich and the poor and the perspectives of what that brings and this, and that. Um, so when we have this focus on class, we start to see the contradictions that uh, capitalism, uh, capitalism brings. Uh, capitalism is, of course, uh, a uh, social system, an economic system where private property reigns supreme, um, the capitalist class basically can have almost unlimited growth and are the dominant class that controls the modes of production. Um, 
And because they control the mode of production and through their private property, uh, laborers and workers are basically exploited um, for their labor because labor or workers don't have anything else to sell, don't have anything else to give for their survival um, except their own work. So that's why they go to these factories and go to these, um, you know, workplaces where the majority of the equipment to produce the things that society needs um, are owned by the capitalist. However, Marx pointed out that there is an inherent exploitation. And because there is an inherent exploitation, it creates a sort of, it creates a friction between the working class uh, or the proletariat and the capitalist class or the bourgeoisie. So this clash really is, can come up to a tipping point or a climax um, where the working class ultimately, you know, according to Marx, overthrows the bourgeoisie or the capitalist class and institutes uh, uh, socialism and communism. The thing is, is under Marx, we don't think that capitalism is just a choice. Um, we think that it's an evolution uh, in part of our systems, a part of our societies. And that's why we say, you know, communism is inevitable because these contradictions and these tensions uh, in reality or our, you know, materialistic reality constantly shows that, you know, there's, there can only be one. And although capitalism has shown that these, the top class has been really uh, dominant and uh, has a lot of influence and in ways that Karl Marx obviously have, uh, did not predict, um, the masses and the people always show that uh, they have the capabilities of overcoming and winning. So when you say, you know, what is communism, what is socialism, what is, you know, to a certain extent capitalism, it's not, you know, sort of the motor production is, you know, when the government does stuff, uh, that's socialism. And the more government does, uh, the more socialistic or communistic is. That's a that's actually a meme from Professor Richard Wolf, you know. And but in reality, it's more of the fact that um, social the ideology uh, the ideology under communism is that uh, we are trying to get to a point in society, move towards a society that is stateless, moneyless, classless, and um, uh, no hierarchies, no nothing. Everybody's equal. It's an ultimate equality, so to speak, where, um, you know, that, that can be attained. And that, that pure definition of communism has never been reached, obviously. You know, in no country mm -hmm. has ever reached that point uh, in, their, uh, uh, pure, in their history, even if they call themselves communists. Um, most of what we see is socialism. And socialism, uh, even according to Marx in his, uh, uh, I, I have pronounced, uh, trouble pronouncing his gotcha program, he describes <laughs> socialism as a transitional state. When, you know, the workers finally take over the society, yet they're transitioning to build the necessary, uh, you know, developmental forces, productive forces. Uh, to build up the material needs for everybody so that they can move towards a transitional, towards a more transitional period towards communism. And under this, under this system, the state, uh, under Lenin, actually, Lenin stated that, you know, the state is the best mechanism in order to do that. The government is the best mechanism in order to represent the people, represent um, the workers and their best interests under the communistic ideology. So when we're talking about socialism, it's the transitional period with the intent to go towards communism um, through what we call the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship of the proletariat is basically, you know, the government that is under the uh, communist ideology that is moving towards this uh, transition. So, you know, we have capitalism that, uh, you know, is much better than feudalism and the master slavery primitive sort of stages that we had before in history. But mm -hmm. what Marx predicted is that we're, we're, we're going to have this breaking point between the rich and the poor in capitalist systems 
where the poor and the masses will come up top and will transition into communism through socialism. So it's not even like, you know, options as much as people say it. It's more of a one, two, three, four, five evolution stage for society uh, that Marx has theorized. And I think, you know, with those definitions and that understanding of how uh, history and how Marx predicted uh, and defines these terms, we can start to say, okay, so, you know, revolution is necessary as a climax of capitalism to transition into communism. Uh, and this transitional period uh, is called socialism, where the means of production is technically owned by the people, but the people is represented by the government. Now, uh, China is, I, I think, you know, we'll probably get into this later, but kind of to touch on this, China is has used uh, different means of transitioning into communism from the Soviet Union. Uh, as we saw in the Soviet Union, it was more centralized, it was more planned. They tried to abolish a lot of things. Um, they focused on class struggle and things like that. Whereas China, uh, you know, through Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, uh, they said, you know, well, after Mao Zedong, they said, you know, we need to focus on economic development a lot more than class struggle and this, you know, international clash between capitalism and socialism. Um, but long story short, we can see how, you know, through these definitions, how history has developed up to now uh, under communism, socialism, and capitalism. All right. Um, when when you talk about the, the inherent and inevitable clash of the classes, I can't think no no other best example of what's taking place in America. For example, mm -hmm. we see what's taking place in, in in the streets of San Francisco, the streets of California, uh, right. the amount of homelessness, the amount of poverty, the amount of people losing their jobs, people having to work endless jobs to just try to stay afloat, to just amassing more and more debt. It's a bubble. In, in my mm -hmm. opinion, and, and listening yep. to what you're saying, that's going to burst. And mm -hmm. when that burst is going to inevitably be a, 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 a violent change, that's not going to be a, a peaceful change, that is not going to be a let's sit together and discuss what we're going to do next. It's going to be, as you said, a revolution when people are... Uh, extended and stretched and pressured to the point of we can't take this anymore um you're going to have a situation that is cataclysmic is is going to change things rapidly and with some degree of of, of violence uh, that we describe as a revolution um so the point is when when societies get there the leaders that are going to come out they need to come out with a better system they need to come up with a system that is factual, that is real, going to put the the, the, the priorities and, and the benefit and, and the well-being of people before anything else. And this is what I experience here in China. When people commented in my video, they were saying, oh, China is not a communist country. China is not a communist country. And I'm like, well, they have a communist party that is ruling. Is that only in name? Um I don't know. Is there capitalism in China? Of course. Do I own my the means of production at my, as one of my viewers calls it, a KTV? I, <laughs> <laughs> it's essentially a training, but we call it a KTV as a joke. It's just an educational center. But I own that uh, enterprise and I derive a profit from this particular enterprise. Um it, China's okay with that. And this is just a small scale. There's, as I said also in my video, there's billionaires like Jack Ma, there's billionaires like uh, Mr. Ren, the, the CEO of founder of Huawei. So China has capitalism, but as I said also in my video, it, it caps it. It does not let it run wild. I, I also said in my video that I felt this is autophagous. I think it's, it's going to eat itself. It's going to self-destroy, um, like a Mission Impossible <laughs> kind <laughs> of video, uh, right. because this continuous and permanent pursuit of profits at any cost, that's what actually destroyed the middle class of America. 
mm-hmm. corporations looking mm-hmm. after more and more profits, moving all the manufacturing to Asia. Great for right. China, but really horrible for America. It destroys manufacturing. It destroyed its middle class. And it's all this search for higher margins, higher margins. So if you had 2 billion profit this year, next year is going to be 2.5 or 3. We're not satisfied. And it's all being propelled and pushed and fueled by the stock markets, um, sure. which I have huge issues with. Um, sure. There is, I am not a very uh, knowledgeable economist, but I always ask myself when Elon Musk smokes a joint and the price of Tesla goes down, what does that have to do with the workers at the factories? What does that have Mm -hmm. to do with the quality of the cars? What does that have to do with with the performance, with the research? It's absolutely nothing to do. It's what people perceive as the value of things, which Mm -hmm. is the best argument for things like Bitcoin and whatnot. It's as valid as a US dollar that is no longer backed by the Federal Reserve. It's just what people perceive it to be. Oh, what the government dictates. Oh, this is what the exchange is. This is the value of the US dollar. Let's just print some more US dollars and people will believe it. Um, Anyway, it's all a fallacy. It's all all paper in the air and, and, and... it's a construct. It's a construct that we are that we are used to live in, and right. I see it coming down and crush and crashing. Um, yeah. We had another 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 topic that I wanted to to visit. You have another another thought, so yeah. let me put well, the title on the screen and okay. see if we can tie it up. So give me your idea, and then we try to tie it up with this people on the screen. <laughs> well, sure, <laughs> and I really do want to emphasize. You know, a lot of people do say that. Uh, China does encapsulate some elements of uh, capitalism and things like that. Um, As I kind of explored a bit more with uh, understanding China's economy, I realized that, uh, you know, they have a socialist market economy. And when we look at markets, uh, we obviously see it as a, you know, capitalist feature. It, you know, it's a exchange where private property exists and commodity flows uh, between people and parties and businesses and whatnot. And uh, it seems very capitalistic. However, you know, in a market, uh, a market in a capitalist society is extremely, if not untamable. You know, you cannot control the capitalists that are seeking profit in a capitalist market. Whereas in a socialist market, the party that reigns supreme, in this case, the Communist Party of China, uh, obviously has a lot better uh, sense of what should happen, how it should be regulated, and where uh, where should the allocation of money, revenue, and taxes should go. Um, I always like this example. When Jack Ma, or you know, let's even use you, if your communications had to come down because the CPC says, hey, we're taking you down. It's done. You're, you know, you're, you, the, the party reigns supreme in that sense. Um, and obviously they won't do that uh, unless, you know, there's a security threat or things like that, which I know you're not. But in the most sense, the party reigns supreme in its regulations, in representing the people and the uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. But can we imagine if, for example, Chuck Schumer, the Democratic Party in the Senate, says, hey, you have to take down your radio station or your communication stations? It's like, no, no, of course not. You know, uh, but we do think that people like Elon Musk has a better um, uh, better chance of controlling that or influencing that than some senator uh, or some Democrat or Republican in uh, Congress, you know? So I think um, it's really important that you understand, or it's really important that people understand that it's more about, um, it's more about who is controlling, uh, what ideology is in control and how that ideology is influencing uh, everything else, so. All right. Um, we, we've got these names uh, on the screen. Um, and to, to summarize what you just said before we go there, um, basically, I feel that communism is a tool. It's a tool to, to achieve well-being for society the same way that 
capitalism could be a tool the same way that the uh, democracy can be a tool it's not so much about the tool itself and its nature it's about the craftsman it's mm. about the person using that tool um democracy could work for america it isn't but it could <laughs> uh, basically they sold um the the, the elections to the super PACs. So it's no longer really the voice of the people is whatever the super PACs or here's an interesting I, uh, comment. Yeah, tell me. Yeah, I mean, as, but as a communist, I can say, no, that's that's the natural progression of what capitalists will do. They will take More over control. the elections. They will take over the democracy for their profits. You know, I mean, uh, there's a great speech by Michael Parenti, you know, when you, we compare um, the dichotomy of what, how this way of thinking like you know why are they sent why are they hurting their people by sending jobs out to you know china and india and all these poor countries when we need the jobs why are they spending billions of dollars on you know a, a jumble jet for the military when the exact same kind was developed a year ago but in the marxist sense is like of course that's going to happen because the capitalists rule the capitalists have this influence they want more profit they want everything they're not going to stop with uh, just your elections your votes they want to develop you know a uh, jumbo jet 2.0 that they just developed last year it's going to be wasteful it's going to be you know all these uh, this stuff so um I, i'm sorry yeah there you go uh, so it, it's it's really when people say that you know these can work is like just just wait until a capitalist can produce some profit off it then you'll see how they can just take it over and use it to their own well you know own benefit you know and, yeah. and that's the frustrating part that um you know we we do say that capitalism crony capitalism or corrupted capitalism this is where you know things go downhill with capitalism but for Marxists, we say, no, that's just capitalism. That That's how it is. You know, capitalism, uh, you know, even when you have a reform or even when you have these political parties saying that they want to rein it in, that's why communist parties actually have the, actually can control the leash, uh, like we are seeing with the Chinese Communist Party or the, uh, um, yeah, the, so, uh, sorry, the Communist, communist China. Party of China. Yeah. Uh, yes, because right. I know, I know, right? CPC, not C, uh, CCP, everybody. So, um, <laughs> but that's the thing. They have the, not only the power, but the ideology, the discipline, the science to actually rein the capitalists in and say, no, 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 uh, we got to do this this way and our way for the people and the workers. And we're not only seeing this in China, but also, uh, you know, Cuba, Vietnam, DPRK, Laos, and those that call themselves uh, uh, communists. So with all that said, uh, that's, uh, you know, when we're talking about what tools are out there, we, we, we really have to emphasize what profits can be derived for capitalists if they can run free. And we have to obviously know if it's a capitalist system, they're going to run free and they're going to take advantage of, of that. You know? The best example of of capitalism is is the healthcare industry and the pharma mm. uh, the pharmacy industry the pharmacological industry. We remember that um, what's it called the um, I Shkreli, the guy who decided to just well, I'm gonna bump yes. the yes. price of this uh, yeah, HIV medicine by seven hundred percent because I own it and I'm the only one. So f everyone. That I mean. That's that's the kind of thing that makes you look at capitalism and say, like, there's got to be a better way. There has got to be a better way. All right. Uh, let me let me ask you about um, uh, Stalin, because Dr. Blair, sure. who's somebody that I follow on Twitter, and I'm sure you probably do. Um, uh, he lately he's been talking about Stalin and he's been accused of a lot of things for uh, defending Stalin. What's your position on Stalin? What can you tell our audiences about Stalin? Where do you stand on 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 him and his mark in history? I think uh, I take the same position as W D uh, W E D Du Bois uh, when he made his uh, sort of uh, uh, speech uh, about Stalin and his passing, and how he was incredibly misunderstood by history. Um, you know, he literally saved the world from fascism, uh, from Nazism uh, in World War II, while, you know, 
in a span with Lenin from 1920, between 1920 and 1940, creating the most powerful country in Europe and the most, the second most powerful country in the world uh, in little under a generation um, through his leadership of being able to produce all these productive forces and everything of that sort. Um, I think it's, there's a lot of slander when it came, uh, came to Stalin and propaganda um, when it comes to understanding the true history of what happened there. Um, I, I, I do want to make a plug. There is, you know, this fantastic lecture, uh, a Marxist analysis on Stalin uh, about, you know, the gulags, about the, you know, uh, what happened to U Ukraine, the, the supposed, you know, purges and things of that sort uh, on what happened uh, under Stalin and how it was heavily propagandized in the West and in capitalist circles um, to the point where they, it was just outright falsehoods. Um, I'm not here to deny, you know, that Stalin was perfect. I'm not here to deny that, uh, uh, that Stalin had his mistakes. He got rid of people and things of that sort. There's, there's no, uh, that's not rational. But the thing is, is that I'm also saying that if we did not have Stalin, we would be living in a very, very different world and a much, uh, a much uglier world, I would say, mm. uh, than uh, what what is uh, being told. This leads us to, to to the next person on the on the banner uh, down there, which is Mao Mao Zedong. Um, I just had uh, the privilege and the honor and the eye opening experience to actually cover part of the history of Mao that led to the, to the founding and establishment of the People's Republic of China. And I say eye opening because I really was not aware of a lot of the things that, that um, actually took place before that. Um, I've always said it in my videos, I came to China knowing so very little about it. And all my learning has been through the 2021 20, years that I've been here. However, this part I wasn't really aware of. And he was a very good strategist mm -hmm. who had a very good mind uh, and a good way of, of rallying people around his ideas and his, his communist and socialist ideas and um, communists at the time. And once he got to power, as you were saying with Stalin, as we could say about Maradona, as we could say of Michael Jackson, nobody's perfect. Mm. He made mistakes. I mean, I was talking to, to people from, from government. I said, like, yeah, there were mistakes made. Um, mm -hmm. However, as you said with Stalin, without Mao, there would not be a China today. Right. Um, nobody's perfect. Everybody's human. And right. what's really important is how out of these pitfalls that the, the, the Communist Party and uh, Mao had, they came out out of them stronger. They they corrected course. They implemented, well, different measures that brought them to where they are today, the second largest economy in the world and within just quick reach of first place. And, well, that's what we need to look at. You need to look at the person for for what they accomplished uh, in, in spite of the, the, the pitfalls that they had. Um, what is your take on Mao and what's this place in history from your point of view? I think you hit it uh, on the nail, you know, the nail on the head right there. I think, uh, you know, Mao is an incredibly important uh, figurehead in China, finding the, uh, you know, the CPC uh, 1921 all the way through 1949, fighting in the revolution, the strategist uh, pushing out the KMT, uh, pushing out the Japanese imperialists and ushering in uh, a extremely strong China that most people have not seen in a hundred years. This was the century of humiliation they were coming out, you know, uh, and it was through Mao and the CPC that brought in a united China, a stronger China, a better China, uh, united uh, in, you know, the country was finally united from you know, uh, the oceans all the way to the mountains of Asia, uh, united as one country again, instead of a fragmentalized war torn, uh, you know, with tribes fighting with tribes, regions breaking up in other regions and imperialists dividing the world for themselves or dividing the country for themselves. Um, Mao uh, was able to bring together multiple classes 
from the peasants to the urban petty bourgeoisie to the proletariat, the workers, and everything, uh, everything of that sort under the uh, CPC. Now, it's obvious. Uh, I really emphasize how, despite all this, why scientific socialism is important. There is no dogma when it comes to socialism or communism. There, as as dedicated or as radical as we you know we may be uh, uh, you know depicted, uh, we are not uh, unrelenting worshippers of an ideology. We are not zealots. You know, we learn how we need to adapt to the people, and this is why it was so important to. You know, it's obviously important that we needed to, you know, uphold uh, uh, Mao Zedong. He was the founder. There's no, despite his mistakes, despite everything, there's no disowning what he has done, the accomplishments that, uh, China, you know, he has done. He laid the foundation of what China is today. Uh, there's no reason to disown, uh, you know, Mao Zedong. But, you know, compared to other, uh, other leaders of the CPC, like the Gang of Four, for example, who, you know, we saw it seen as ultra left. And, you know, they were obviously uh, people that should not be held up to the same light as Mao was held up. To but because of the scientific socialism that the CPC abided by, they were like, OK, we need to admit that mistakes were made under Mao, whether it was the Great Leap Forward or the uh, Cultural Revolution and things of that sort. And the important portion of that is when Deng Xiaoping came in and said, we need to open up and read. We need to use markets. We need to, you know, um, adjust our perspective away from class struggle and more to economic development because uh, our people continue to struggle. It was in the 1980s, China had a population of 900 million and 80% of them were still peasants, you know? Mm -hmm. And when we had this ideology that said that things were going to be better and we need to push for uh, better standards of living, yet we have this staggering statistic. Uh, the Communist Party adapted extremely well because of Deng Xiaoping. And it was because of not only looking at the Soviet Union, but going further back to the roots of Marx's uh, Marx and saying, what's our material reality here? What do we need to fix here to give the people what they need? Because this is what it's all about. Giving the people a better and what yeah well no I, I wanted to i wanted to jump in with a very very short comment um sure. when i look at china's development and, and the communist party it is extremely vivid how strategic they are in their development um they are clashing ideas so, oh wait, we got to do this no i don't think so so there's a change there's there's a evolution within the party and they come up to some new strategy then Xiaoping brought the strategy of okay let's enhance the means of production of the country so that we can have more resources to help more people then came harmonious uh, developments of society and we are right now with Deng Xiaoping and his ideas, uh, Deng Xiao, uh, sorry, not Deng Xiaoping, <laughs> Xi Jinping's thoughts, which is more about let's go back to the essence of what our Communist Party is. Um, and that class that class down on on um, corruption, it's been the mark of his of his eight, nine years um, as a leader of the Communist Party of China and the country. Um, it, it is visual. I can tell people how I used to work in government and, well, not in government, but with government, certain projects as a consultant, okay, totally mm. external. And, and you could see like, that's not, that's a bit shady. Mm, that's a bit mm. shady. I'm talking mm. like the early 2000s. And, yeah. and uh, today when you want to do any kind of work with the government, everything has to be as transparent as you would have it anywhere else in the world, as you would expect it. So from a very layman's experience, I have seen the change that, that Xi Jinping has brought in terms of corruption and, and, and the trust in society. I wanted to add one very important point when you were talking about um, how united China is. And this is something that the world does not understand. People like Gordon Chang, people like all these, all these China haters that keep to keep attacking China and trying to divide it, they do not understand how united China is. 
I just posted something on my WeChat uh, about we here in Dongguan, we had one case of COVID-19 uh, last month in the middle of the month on the 15th. And there was a massive campaign for testing. They found another case and there was another massive campaign of testing. Within those two or three weeks, there were more than 20 million tests done to the population of my city. More than 20 million tests done. And two days ago, we were told that we could uh, reopen our training center, our, our English training center. Um, wow. So we're back to work. We're healthy and we are safe. But what does it give you when the government does something like that? It gives mm -hmm. you a feeling of trust. I trust that the government has my back. Yeah. That's that's extremely important. But how do they manage to do something like this? Let me let me let me get back to to what I wanted to say initially. UK Boris Johnson two days ago said, "Oh, we're reopening the UK." So I am, I'm experiencing two different places, my city reopening and the UK reopening on the extremely different circumstances. Boris Johnson is opening in defeat of the pandemic. He said, and I read, uh, we must reconcile ourselves sadly to more deaths from COVID-19. If that's not defeat, then why, can't, why is our experience so different? Because we are united. <laughs> Because the government comes and says, everybody stay at home, all businesses closed, no school, everybody gets tested. And it's painful and it's expensive and it's, and it's difficult. But here's the funny thing. Here in China, and I want everybody to hear me out, nobody asks him or herself, are we going to make it? Are we going to make it out of this little, uh, we know we will. Because we've had the experience of having done it in 2020. We know that if we all do it together, if we all do it at the same time, if we all do it right, it'll be short. Three weeks, we're back to normal. Three weeks. So when people talk about China not being united, they have no idea what they're talking about. Everybody gives uh, their time, their money, their patience, their struggles, their luxuries away in order to to commit to what the government is asking us to do which is test stay at home and and just wait wait up until this goes away so but that, uh, I, and that really resonates with me you know because when i see that as a marxist i say you know this rings what we mean by the dictatorship of the proletariat and I know when people see dictatorship, it's like, uh, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know about that, but it's a dictatorship mm. of the people. The people are actually, you know, the government is actually looking out for the welfare of the people and why we need such a powerful word when it comes to it. We're obviously seeing that. Why, you know, when Boris Johnson or Trump or now Joe Biden is saying, you know, we're going to open up even though there's a, another variance, but, you know, uh, we're getting more sick and, oh, well, we'll see what happens. Um, when China says, hey, uh, there's a case, we need everybody to do this, and uh, we need this done uh, as soon as possible because uh, we know if we all work together um, and we've done this before, and even in the outbreak, even in the beginning of uh, COVID in Wuhan, um, when the city locked down completely, the people were still able to, you know, I, I was talking to Jing Jing Li from uh, CGTN and basically how party leaders and members were able to deliver groceries to people that needed it mm -hmm. or, you know, keep tabs. Uh, community leaders were doing all this. And I cannot, I cannot imagine, you know, police officers knocking on the door over here and bringing me food, you know, when we're all locked down. I cannot imagine, um, you know, uh, when when I was talking to Jing Jing Li, uh, she, we, we were talking about the evictions that were happening in the United States during COVID, um, whereas compared to China, it's like, I never heard of that. This is a crisis. Everybody, you know, obviously needed to stay where they are, even if they couldn't pay their rent and everything like that, you know, and Obviously, the government came in and things started to work out later, but um, I was just really 
it's night and day when we compare the governments and the people and how you know the governmental influence is more trustworthy because of the you know what i say is the ideology but others you know may have different opinions but what um you know the when i see democracies liberal democracies outside in the west um struggle they uh they obviously i obviously see it because of money i obviously see it because hey we need our workers back in the factory uh elon musk is threatening uh the governor of california to move his factories down to texas if they don't open up their workers you know or if they don't open up their factories for the workers you know uh you know all the way down to you know our economy is down we have to open up uh, the state is suffocating because of the economy there's no unity in in uh such a you know uh such a system economic and political system but whereas china has a more united system it's you know you you you're, were, you're, you're guaranteed to su be successful there are a couple of things that 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 i concluded one of them was that well america is all about individual freedoms so people deciding not to mask up uh, it doesn't register in my head i mean why why would you do that why would you not just and I thought that there's this whole idea of individual freedoms, but there's also this whole idea of we can't do what China is doing. We can't accept that China is doing it better than we do. If we do mm -hmm. what they did, um, um, we are accepting their leadership. <laughs> right. So I think right. that there was a component of, of, of egos um, yep. from a lot of Western countries that, that's like we can't uh, – force our people impose our our authority uh, as government and tell people to do what china is doing because then what are we if not followers not right. leaders anymore um, they were, they, they were saying, like, sure it's just one quick point you know they were saying the wuhan lockdown was authoritarian measures but three months later we had our own lockdowns you know just uh look uh, it's, it's I, I, this is the end of my post on, on my WeChat moment today. I say because uh, we are united and we trust that the government will put health before wealth, which mm. incidentally reignites our economy faster. Oh. We were back. Look, I went to Wuhan earlier this year and they told me, yeah, public parks reopen on April, April 8th, 2020. I'm like, what? This is Wuhan, the epic. Well, not the epicenter, but the place where it was found and the place yeah. where the world knew about COVID-19 and, and, and the place that was locked down first. And and by April, they were already open. That's two months. That's eight, eight weeks. Yep. So that's 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 the short sightedness of certain governments. If you impose measures widely, you will be back on track in no time. There were some people commenting in one of my videos like, oh, um, I think it was a British person. Uh, if you're watching, thank you for your comment because I'm bringing it up here. Like, we're going back. What should we do? I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. All, all I can tell you is that I feel very sorry for you and the government that you guys have chosen to elect and, and the people that you have chosen to have in power. Because if you had, if you close Bristol for 14 days, but Liverpool is open, well, when the when the lockdown ends up in Bristol and people from Liverpool start visiting Bristol, they're going to bring the virus again. So unless everybody does it at the same time, it's not going to work. So anyway, well, we, I want to move on to the next topic because the next topic sure. is, 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 is a heavy one. Heavy. But if you have any last idea, let me know. No, and but that was the thing. I was going to say, you know, it's more about the economics of these sorts of things. When we see, you know, why one city is opening over another versus the outbreaks and things like that. Um, and when we have conservative governments versus liberal parties kind of, you know, take over, we're still kind of seeing the struggle, uh, you know, Boris Johnson or Joe Biden, we're still seeing variants explode of COVID-19 and, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes, but it, it, it does seem like uh, wealth over health is the model here <laughs> rather than uh, health over wealth. And the thing is that the longer they keep it, um, lose they don't get it under control the longer it will be it will be necessary for us to keep you guys in quarantine to require right. you know what i mean the right. the faster you get it under control then the faster we can continue and resume our global trade and global travel and all these things it is you 
holding it, mm-hmm. holding the line. It is you holding it uh, from actually taking place and happening. All right, Bay Area, I want to go into the next topic, which is one that I also made a video about this and I got a lot of backlash. I don't know if you ever okay. watched that one. When I talked about um, uh, the case of Venezuela, right? Mm. The question is why communism manifests itself so differently in different countries. Is there any spelling mistakes? Manifest? No, it's fine. (laughs) No, you got it. You got it. I've I've experienced um, Chinese communism, and it's without a doubt a fantastic system that delivers to the people. Um, Mm -hmm. But when people talk to me about Venezuela, when people talk Mm -hmm. to me about Cuba, well, obviously, we need to talk about the embargoes. Mm-hmm. We talk about how they, the model, the communist ideal and the communist system hasn't been allowed to, to develop because of the, the embargoes. And my right. point when I made the video about Venezuela is that China played it. Remember, going back to being strategic, mm-hmm. China played it right. They mm-hmm. made themselves strong. They made themselves powerful. They made mm-hmm. themselves, they made the world depend on China. Mm-hmm. And now they, they, they actually have the upper hand. Um, communism in Venezuela, for example, was, was, they were not ready to do it. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. They just imposed bans and, and that's it. They never had a chance. Mm-hmm. My question is, Do you think these countries ever had a chance? Could they have played their their cards a little bit better? Unfortunately, I think when it comes to Latin America, especially, um, we were always under the boot heel of the belly of the beast, the American empire. You know, ever since the Monroe Doctrine, that gave the United States a free range in Latin America from the banana republics that basically had these wealthy capitalists from the United States uh, build roads, communications, e- infrastructure, everything for these countries, and literally uh, took out the dictate or took out the governments because they thought they were threatening their wealth. You know, um, America has always had this overwhelming influence in Central America. Um, and when this is why I really enjoy Marxism-Leninism because it really makes us look at the actual history of these countries and how they developed. Um, when we look at China, they were obviously in a different position than Venezuela, Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, and things like that. In a way that, you know, they really didn't necessarily directly had a uh, you know conflict with the United States. I know the United States sort of funneled money and you know support to the KMT so they would win and things like that. But there was a larger sort of predicament uh, during the Cold War. And knowing the United States and knowing how short-sighted they may be, um, China was pinned, you know, the Soviet Union versus the United States. And when Deng Xiaoping saw that they needed to open up and reform, the United States used that and really said, okay, they're just going to introduce capitalism and, you know, they're, they're going to go back to liberalism. uh, And, you know, this is a evolution towards uh, our, uh, our way of life rather than, you know, more towards communism. You know, when they are opening up and reforming, that means they're moving away from the Soviet Union. They're not going to be uh, a superpower that allies with the Soviet Union. And this is what create the Sino, you know, the Sino Soviet split, so to speak, uh, even more. They, it, it wedged the divide even more. However, you know, when China and China was really starting to build up this uh, this notion of peaceful development, you know, that, hey, we're not going to get involved in, you know, exporting revolutions like the Soviet Union, nor are we going to, you know, uh, say that uh, we're going to embargo you or do anything like that. We're just going to do business. And I know even a lot of, yeah, that's the thing. 
a lot of leftists even say, you know, why are you trading with, uh, you know, the dictators of the Philippines or Israel or things like that? Uh, and we constantly say it's part of their peaceful development to generate what they need for their economy and for their people. You know, um, when we saw the Soviet Union trying to isolate themselves and this, you know, not a failed theory, but this practice that really didn't work of isolating communist countries amongst each other to just develop their own economies and not trade with the West or not trade with capitalist countries. China challenged that, and China obviously traded with everybody. And that ultimately led, with the geopolitical situation of the Cold War, we have to kind of connect all these different dots to say, okay, China is successful because, you know, United States needed to tear them away from the Soviet Union. China was looking to open up and reform. Um, they were breaking away from this communistic isolation path, uh, theory and bada bing, bada boom. Now, when we look at, you know, Cuba and their really huge headbutting with the United States, um, the embargo on top of that due to their alliance with the USSR you know, we always think of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis as the start of the embargo, mm -hmm. but, you know, that was in reaction towards the United States placing nuclear missiles near the Soviet border. You know, that wasn't a secret operation that the Soviet Union was instigating. No, it was in response in to... reaction. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that obviously isolated Cuba, not, not because they were communists, but they were but because that uh, they were assisting the Soviet Union with weaponry, dangerous weaponry. But obviously, after the Soviet Union fell, the embargo still took place, you know. And uh, Fidel's, I always say, you know, looking at Fidel's Castro resolve and the Communist Party of Cuba and seeing all the, I could not believe the accomplishments that they have under their belt, El eliminating uh, literacy, having, you know, longer standards, uh, longer uh, life expectancy than any other Latin American country, even beyond the United States, better health care, um, you know, uh, better education. They, they have, you know, they are the only Latin American country to develop their own COVID-19 uh, vaccine that is 92% mm -hmm. effective. You know, they have medicine in Latin America coming from Cuba is top notch. Everybody wants to go study in Cuba because they, they produce some of the better doctors in the, in, in the continent. Exactly. And, and the thing is, is that there is obviously struggles that uh, Cuba is enduring, not only because of the embargo, but because of, you know, uh, when you see when we see that, you know, taxi drivers are getting paid more than doctors and things of that sort. Um, there's obviously these sort of uh, irregularities and inequalities that happen. Um, but at the same time, when we saw Cuba open up, when Obama lifted the uh, embargo, for example, it was, you know, Cuba was really willing, able, and ready to accept that there will be markets similar to what China was doing, you know? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until Trump came in and he says, no, I don't trust Cuba. You know, I, I, we're going to go this hard line again uh, against communism again and put the embargo back on. And, uh, you know, it was frustrating to see because Cuba would have, Cuba was developing great. And, you know, they actually admitted in their constitution that private property exists. You know, they actually put that in their new constitution. However, that was more for, you know, we're getting ready to you uh, to sort of mimic what China is doing and develop markets here uh, under the Communist Party so we can develop economically. You know, um, however, the United States still being the United States and with the history of Latin American imperialism, uh, we there was no stability for that market once the embargo uh, was put on place. So when we go to uh, Venezuela, and when we see how Venezuela developed in this history, in this anti, uh, you know, communism uh, treatment from the United States, along with the, you know, Monroe Doctrine and Banana Republics, um, it's obviously going to be a struggle when Hugo Chavez got elected. You know, um, Hugo Chavez got elected in 1998, um, but he was, I, I, I believe, like in his early, uh, early. Uh, 
I guess, early stages of being a Marxist leader. He was trying to attempt revolutions, overthrow the government. That didn't work. But he, he did something through his election. He, he said Venice, uh, socialism can actually get elected or, and can pursue its radical agenda um, through the elections of Latin America, through those electoral systems. And this obviously, you know, this isn't new. We, we heard about Salvador Allende in Chile in 1973. Um, you know, he got elected, but, you know, what happened to that? And that kind of reinforced this notion that only revolution can really overthrow capitalistic powers. However, Hugo Chavez, you know, there were attempted coups. There were, uh, you know, sabotages from uh, uh, capitalists and privateers that were either hoarding supplies or even bearing food so that they would uh, do this shortage crisis and blame it on the government, you know. And all these things would happen along with the embargo from the United States, this whole thing of <laughs> this whole ridiculousness of Juan Guaido being the president still, despite the fact that he is nowhere near what the power of Maduro and that party is. That's absolutely ridiculous. But we still see, you know, how embargo is still at play. So people are extremely struggling in Venezuela. How are they going to adapt now? Because... The evolution of this is that Hugo Chavez was elected. Their socialism wasn't, um, you know, despite trying to have open communications with the United States, Hugo Chavez is still trying to work things out. They just did not like the socialism. They did not like the nationalization of the oil. They did not like, you know, all these sorts of things, despite the fact that the people desperately needed, the people elected these people for more equality, for more wealth, for everything. And Hugo Chavez needed to deliver that to the people first before he appeased the governments of others that many, many prior presidents of Venezuela has been doing before. They, they say like 50 to 60 percent of Venezuela were below the poverty line before Hugo Chavez. They say that, you know, um, so many homeless, illiteracy, uh, the, they, Venezuela had massive amounts of oil wealth, but, you know, the billions of dollars were not going to the people. You know, and because of such extreme poverty and the violence of the right wing government uh, up until Hugo Chavez, um, it was a sort of brush, breath of fresh air for the people. And, you know, when you have such intense imperialism from the United States controlling such a uh, the political scene in that area, um, and then all of a sudden all all ties are, are cut loose because Hugo Chavez comes to the picture and Maduro is still, you know, in power then it's just like, okay, well, you know, we're, we're, we're going to cut it off and let them flounder, not only cut it off, but tell all our other European wealthier partners not to trade with them, not to do anything else with them and strangle them out. You know? Um, it's, so it's what's starting to take place in China. It's what's starting mm, to take yep. place here in China with the bans. I mean, in the past, they were called embargoes right now. They're called bans and sanctions. Mm. They're, they're, for example, what they're doing with Xinjiang, they're just going after the most productive industries in the region, cotton, right. tomatoes, right. solar panels, those those areas where there's there's so much leadership in the world coming from this area, that's what they're going and trying to disrupt. And Blinken mm. just last week, and I did a show with Mario Coolo the other day, he just blanketed all of China all of a sudden. He just said like, there's forced labor also, in all areas of China, not just Xinjiang. So we invite all of our partner countries to uh, stop basically trading and decoupling from China, not buying uh, products, not only from Xinjiang, but all of China. You, you, I mean, you can actually listen to, to that short clip from the, uh, state, the Secretary of State and, and you'll be just surprised to know that, Sorry, that uh, he my just, battery just died. I'm just switching it out very quickly. So. All right, no worries. Uh, so he just basically said, okay, perhaps I could play it for you. Let me see if I have it here. Uh, okay. Let me see if I can play that video here. Okay, well, you change your battery, I'll play this video. This is Secretary. We also report on what's happening in Xinjiang, in the Xinjiang Aut Uyghur Autonomous Region of China. The Chinese government has detained more than one million people in as many as 
1,200 state-run internment camps throughout Xinjiang. Many detainees are subjected to physical violence, sexual abuse, and torture to induce them to work, producing apparel, electronics, solar equipment, agricultural products. And while the practices are the most egregious in Xinjiang, this year's report notes that China has subjected its citizens to coercive labor practices in other parts of the country as well. Did you hear that? I did. Did you hear that? And so he's just saying that, um, uh, sorry, uh, let me change the order here. He just said that um, it's all of China, basically. Forced labor is all of China. And now let's invite all our partner countries to decouple from China. It's the same that they, they're doing or that they've been doing to Cuba, to, to Venezuela, and to many other countries. But my take is China is ready to take on these sanctions. I mean, China has built such a strong middle class that they can support the economy and not be as affected. And when you talk about Venezuela, I liken it to America. America is capitalist and corrupt as Venezuela used to be was extremely corrupt, Venezuela. When Chavez came in, it was such a drastic change that they, they, they automatically the United States came in and started all these bans and all these sanctions. And, uh, all right, you lost your camera again. Let me put myself oh, here. Yeah, sorry. Uh, go ahead. No worries. <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, now it's taking place in China. Now it's happening in China. They're trying to ban, they're trying to um, embargo China and decouple from China just because they can't compete. Um, what I see in other um, communist countries like Venezuela, for example, is the lack of meritocracy. And this is something that I made in that video and uh, a lot of people kind of like complained about. Um, um, let me bring you back in... Uh, so we can have this stuck together. Sure, um, sure. When you look at Maduro, he came into power with almost no experience in government, with very little education. That's not the case in China. In China, only the best get to rule. That's that's a point of 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 discussion that I would like sure. to have to you uh, with you today. Does sure. that have any effect on the situation that Venezuela is in right now? Does that complicate things moving forward? I think if somebody with a lot more baggage, with a lot more experience in government, were in government leading Venezuela, would there be a way out that could be, uh, I don't know, devised? What, what do you think is the effect of, of having a leader like Maduro and his particular education and preparation um, on the situation of Venezuela today? Well, we got to understand that there's three caveats to uh, Venezuela. Uh, first off, the ruling party, the PSUV, uh, I think that's the uh, United Socialist Party of Venezuela. They are... Um, not necessarily a communist party. Uh, the Communist Party of Venezuela is the actual communist, you know, Marxist Leninist party that is actually, you know, getting elected as part of the parliament. And there's a lot of actually friction that's going on between the Communist Party and the current, you know, Maduro Maduro's party uh, because of the, you know, the continual divisions, the class division that keeps happening in Venezuela today. Um, but despite that. Uh, we all we also need to recognize that uh, Venezuela may not be considered economically uh, a socialist country, even a communist country, let alone a communist country, uh, because its economy is still dominated by private ownership. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that eighty percent of the mark, uh, eighty percent of the market, and two thirds of workers are still uh, under private capitalist uh, ownership. Uh, between uh, what was it seventy? But the, the we're comparing that to China, where SOEs and you know public ownership and things of that sort uh, are more prevalent in the landscape 
of the economy of China compared to Venezuela, we can't really say Venezuela is even reaching socialism yet, although they are under a socialist party. Uh, the third thing is obviously, you know, uh, Marxist, Leninist, and communists do believe more revolutionary means of overthrowing uh, capitalism versus, you know, getting elected and starting to push for massive reforms under the current system. Um, now, Hugo Chavez and Latin, the rest of Latin America is presenting a very, very interesting sort of development in Marxism-Leninism in that, you know, uh, when we look at not only Venezuela, but Bolivia, now Peru, and other countries that are experiencing a pink tide of new socialist leaders uh, that call themselves even communists and Marxist-Leninists, I think even Chile, the, the current leading presidential candidate, mm -hmm. is a communist. You know, um, but they're using electoral means to get there rather than revolutionary means or overthrow and things like that. And by the way, revolution does not necessarily mean the typical way of violence like guns and everything like that. Uh, you know, revolution can mean many sorts of things like mass demonstrations, mass movements, civil disobedience, and things of that too, in compilation with other more radical means. So with these three caveats, I have to, you know, really say that when we look at the CPC and its evolution from 1921 to just 50 members all the way to today, 95 million members, um, we obviously see the struggles that came with that too. There was a lot of trial and error that they had to go through, not only through winning an entire revolution for China, but also, you know, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, Deng Xiaoping's opening up and reform the corruption that came in with it, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, how they had to combat that corruption and how to instigate more meritocracy and more tests, examined. I mean, this has been a long evolution of trial and error rather than just, you know, uh, okay, uh, we're just going to get in there and just do some tests yeah, or meritocracy and things like that. <laughs> it's not like that. You know, and when we, but that's the thing, you know, when we see Venezuela, their sort of socialist party only took over in the early 1990s, you know, and I'm not sure if, you know, the current party, Maduro's party, what exactly they are trying to portray. I know Maduro, uh, you know, he started from a bus driver all the way up to, you know, climbing the party ranks into the vice presidency under Hugo Chavez and then taking over after Hugo died. Um, it, it's really, it's really a delicate situation. And I can't judge necessarily on how, you know, the meritocracy over there is developing compared to the long history of the CPC and how they got to where they are today. You know, um, uh, there, there's been a lot of ups and downs with their leaders. Don't get me wrong, even with the CPC. But, you know, to finally get it right with, not to finally get it right, because there are obviously some other great leaders before Xi Jinping as well. Um, but uh, to have Xi Jinping in such a effective era for Chinese governance and through his leadership of stopping corruption, making the party more accountable, and doing everything that the people needed to uh, needed to see under the Communist Party, and comparing that, it, it really does set a great example for not only you know Maduro and his government, but all leftists and all communists, and what they really should strive for for the people. Because there is no way we are going to condemn what Xi Jinping has done for China and the development and everything that he's like. every communist is like, yes, thank you. This is what we need to happen. This is what needs to you know go forward with. And this is how we need to properly transition into communism. It creates you know? a model. It creates a model. Yes, it creates exactly. a blueprint. It creates a, a goal. Like this is what we would like to become. All yeah. right. Um, Bay Area, man. We're going into an hour and 50 minutes. We say we wanted to do an hour. This is a very interesting topic. I still right. am convinced that I am a communist at heart. Sure. And I'm a capitalist because this is, this is the life we live in. Sure. <laughs> if I could work for free, I would, but yeah. it's just not in the cards at the moment. Um, I want to thank you so very much. I want to remind you, um, all of you guys watching, that um, 
Bay Area's channel is in the description. So if you want to go see his content, if you want to go see his videos and much more into detail, these explanations that he has with the different leaders in different countries uh, and the different explanations of the different concepts, go to his channel. It's in the description down below and uh, subscribe. So you learn a lot more about the work that he does and uh, the message that he wants to send out out in the world. I want to thank all of you guys for watching. And I want to remind you that um, this kind of content doesn't get advertised too much. So if I may suggest you to hit the link in the description down below to buy me a cup of coffee. And if you're here in China, you could scan the QR code and do the same if you're using WeChat. Um, Bay Area, man, I'll give you a few seconds for, for us to wrap up. Um, what do you take from this from this show today? Sure. I mean, first off, thank you so much for having me. I know, you know, uh, I, I love the fact how quickly we were able to do all this and have such a deep discussion about <laughs> these topics. And, you know, the, the the purpose of this wasn't trying to convert you or convince you or anything like that. It was, it was really informative. And I think it was really in depth. And I really enjoyed it. And please have me on anytime. I'll be more than happy to join either True, a panel man. or anything like that. <laughs> uh, I know my getup is obviously a little uh, different from others, but I, I really do try to put in the work and the research and everything to really be uh, as respectable as possible. But thank you and so I much for having me. That. And from the comments and the and the and the chat on the side, I can see that a lot of people appreciate that as well. All right, there you go. cool Bay Area. Thank you so very much. Have a lovely evening over there. I'm just gonna go have lunch. And well, guys, until we see you again, thank you so much and have a good one. Bye.